Welcome back, Offstage Radio. I'm your gracious host, Chris Schnabel, and we are back. Man, Kendrick Lamar, dude could do nothing wrong. He is so great. I absolutely love me some Kendrick Lamar. Shout out to my friend Chandler Williams for getting me out of Kendrick Lamar all those years ago when he was first coming up Section 80 High Power. So we have a great podcast for you today. Great episode, podcast, episode, whatever. Well, however you're listening, we have a great episode for you today. A basketball episode. Ah, shoot some hoops. Um, we have from the Horse Podcast, Mike Schubert and Adam Mamawala. They're going to be joining us to kind of talk about their podcast, talk a little bit of basketball. And then we have Jackie Jamelis, who is a WNBA player. She played up in Europe. Um, she great basketball player and a great mind. Um, For people that might be going through something because she went through a lot. She had a bunch of injuries on her knees in college and in high school and then had numerous surgeries after that. Um, So her journey from being this star high school player, college player, going into the W or going into basketball, following that and her journey is just incredible. So She was an incredible person to talk to. We got these guys coming up. Basketball episode, you know, Gonzaga. They're all about their basketball number one team in the nation hopefully when this comes out so <laughs> still i would i really hope they don't get upset from now until then because i'll be really upset and if you call me you're like yo are you upset i'll be like yes i am upset uh, we're in the home studio again i know we're bouncing back and forth we'll try to keep more consistency maybe the home studio a little more um but definitely check out isaac radio that's where we usually were the last couple weeks we've been in isaac check out dan cummings if you didn't get him last week jamie roots Jimmy Roots, he retired. That's two two people retired after coming on the show. So, uh, Jackie, Mike, and Adam, be careful. You might uh, be considering retirement now that you came on my show. It just must be me. You know, you come on my show, you retire. That's just how it goes. So we got a great episode coming up. Definitely stay tuned. I'm going to start rambling and let these guests come on and let them talk about this stuff. So we'll see you. We'll be right back with Mike and Adam from the Horse Podcast coming up right after this short break. Intermission, we'll call it. We'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome back, Offstage Radio. We are joined now by the Horse Hoops Podcast folks, Mike Schubert and Adam Mamawala. Did I get that right, M- Mamawala? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you nailed boom. it. Good job. You got it more boom. correct than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. It's like I do research or something. How are you guys doing today? Good, man. How about yourself? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You know, it's a little early. It's not really early. Why do I, I don't know. Like, it's like 10 o'clock for us here. Um, I don't That's know. It's early. Come early. on. In yeah. in this trying times, yeah, that's, that's early. Right. And this Any trying time before time, noon is early. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Before COVID, I was waking up at noon. Now I'm wake, I wake up at like six every day, and I go run. Like I've changed my life completely. It's it's yeah. it's a whole a whole one eighty. It's crazy. Oh, are so, you bettering yourself during a pandemic? I know. <laughs> Gross. What, what an awful person. I, I thought mean. we all agreed that we'd be miserable this whole time. <sighs> The thing is, you're on Pacific time, too, because Gonzaga, Gonzaga's in Washington, right? Spokane, Washington. Okay. Come Gonzaga's on, one know. of those things, like, my entire life, I had no idea where Gonzaga was. I just knew to always pick them in the NCAA brackets because they always found a way to win. Shout yeah. out to Gonzaga for that. Yeah, try and to, I try to say, D- yeah. I was was just saying that I lived in Seattle for two years and then like a bunch of my friends said they went to Gonzaga. I was like, is Gonzaga in Washington? And they were like, yes. And then then Mike pronounced it Spokane and he got beat up. Uh, No, I I do know that one. I I do know it's Spokane. (laughs) I'm originally from New York and I told people like, yeah, I'm going Ah. to Gonzaga. I'm going out, going out to, to out west they're like wait isn't it in washington dc it's like oh no it's not in washington (laughs) dc it's in washington the state (laughs) in spokane where's spokane i'm not even gonna try you thought it was dc i'm not even gonna try to explain that it's seattle but just make it easier for people (laughs) so i got a question how do you guys know each other we go way back from mercer county community college tennis camp in uh central new jersey in uh like the trenton princeton ish area yeah so i i taught mike tennis when he was in like middle school Mm -hmm. so i like i grew up playing tennis competitively and that was always my summer job in, in high school and college and i i guess at the time i met mike i would have been maybe like between my freshman and sophomore year of college or something like that 
And so I would teach at this summer camp every year. And Mike and uh, another friend of ours, Chris, were like pretty much the only people who were close enough in age to me that I felt like I could talk to them like human beings and they weren't like little kids. And so we kind of developed a, a friendship because I guess I would have been like, I don't know, maybe I was like 18 and you were 13 or something like that when yeah, we were first met. Yeah, you're four years older than me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, and we like kind of stayed in touch over the years and, and, uh, that, but I guess what year would that have been? Uh, I want to say you joined, I feel like you had become a camp counselor at the time when I had already like established myself as like a, 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 a mainstay as the, the, camp, as the class clown there. <laughs> I don't know the about class clown. clown but you like, were the no way there, you were the class clown. <laughs> no <laughs> there way. Was like, there was like a set crew of us that like we it was they were weekly camps, but and you could do like basketball camp or baseball camp or whatever. But eventually, it got to the point where like it was the only time I played tennis, so I would just do four straight weeks of tennis camp. And I started. I think I started going in like fourth grade. I want to say you joined in like when I was in seventh grade. Yeah. So you would you it's a while ago years older. So I would have been like yeah fifteen, 15 years something like that yeah seventeen something like that um but yeah it was an interesting camp where like it, me and our buddy chris and josh pacifico we had like gone to the camp for so long that we like had this we were in this like intermediary status of like we were better than just the regular campers but we weren't counselors <laughs> so like we became tight with the counselors and then when adam's like not that much older so yeah. we became close we would goof around and stuff i do remember me and chris were like very early on trying to convince adam to to really go after stand-up because he had like talked about doing it mm -hmm. and we egged him on to where he did like a stand-up set in front of a bunch of kids which like looking back <laughs> wild situation but did kill? Very an original fan did you kill well, but, you kill but to be to be fair though I, I i mean i feel like i did was... as well as one could do in front of a bunch of eight-year-olds <laughs> but um it was like to to be clear this was not like nike tennis camp this was daycare yeah. with like a tennis theme <laughs> oh, it was yeah. very much like not tennis focused so yeah. there was a lot i mean there was a lot of frivolity going on it was a silly and goofy camp. It was run by, it, it was first run by this dude, like this old guy who must have been 3,000 years old named Mr. Black. But then Mark Petrel, like, took over or at least ran the intermediate camp and he was super cool this was like shoe collector before shoe collecting existed like he had yeah. 200 pairs of sneakers in the year 2000 which was like what uh and he would like i remember on thursdays like during the week-long thing he would bring in all of his like hip-hop tapes and he'd play like he would like cut together stuff with Beastie Boy tracks and Wu Tang and all this stuff. So it was like a very loose. That might be more inappropriate than me doing comedy. Say, what a yeah. camp! We do stand <laughs> up comedy and then we play Wu Tang. <laughs> 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 what a camp that is! I I do got to say, isn't it funny how when you went to camp as a kid, you like think the counselors are just so much older than you, and they're really only like three years older. You just yeah, never, it's same. With it's, it's the same thing. It's like, like when yeah, when you think about like. If, if you were in high school and one of your teachers was like just out of college, like mm -hmm. a 22 or 23 year old should not be in charge of anyone. <laughs> and you're like, wow, they must be so old. And it's like, oh, no, they're, like, <laughs> they're only like three years older than me. I could be yeah. there in three years, actually. And then, and then you go like, shit, I could be there in three years. This isn't good. So yeah. how did you guys come together to make this podcast then if you know each other so long? So I had been working on the show for a while with another guy, Multitude, Eric Silver, and then he started taking on more of like a production role within the company, uh, and he was getting too much on his plate to where he didn't have the time to devote to a horse, but I wanted to keep the show going, so... I had uh, reached out to Adam. I had like thought about getting Adam in the mix at some point, you know, just having guests on or something. So when this came up, it felt like the perfect opportunity. And I just asked Adam, like I asked him like, hey, we're doing like a test run of different guest hosts, which was like a complete lie. It was like, I'm, I want to get Adam in on the show for sure. Uh, and we just have to like make sure it's good. So we did like one episode and like once we hit record, I like messaged Eric and I was like, we're good. Like we've got the new co-host. You know, did did you really not even, because I, I don't know the, the all the details of this, but like had you not even reached out to anybody else about I no. it? zero people yeah. <laughs> it was just like it was basically just like i knew it was going to be good but just to save the awkwardness of like having to backtrack i had to set it up as like hello uh we're testing out new co-hosts we're just like going to do a bunch of guests run blah 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 but it was wow. like i knew it was going to work and then it did and now things are wonderful killed the audition you killed <laughs> well the audition. And, and i don't know i don't know that that mike knows this but like i kind of approached it that way too where i was like 
even I didn't I didn't assume that I was the only person you would talk to, but I I did entertain the idea that like if it went well, this could be something that like we could just do in general. And also for me, like as a stand up comic during a pandemic, like I have a lot more time for things like this than I maybe mm -hmm. would have prior to last year. So like um, and, and also like, you know, Mike and I have stayed friends over the years. We've gone and like visited that other uh, guy from from tennis camp, Chris, like in Boston. And um, I think just like the way that we communicate and like the rapport that we have lends itself to a podcast being good. And now do you guys have, you have tennis backgrounds. What's your basketball background like? Who I started playing ever since I was like five, just like when you play every sport and then you slowly weed out the ones you don't like, or at least that's what it was growing up in Jersey for me. It was like everybody played soccer, baseball, basketball, and then summer was like up for grabs. Uh, yeah. I didn't play football because my parents were smart and didn't want me to get a concussion. So... <laughs> I like I started the way you play basketball. I'm sure you've had concussions. <laughs> I mean, I probably would be under some protocol. But yeah, so I just started playing at five, um, you know, in your like normal leagues, stuck with it, ended up playing for my middle school team. I made it in, I think, either seventh grade or eighth grade. I made the team. He started playing um, at five. He never has played the five. To be <laughs> yeah, sometimes you joke, but sometimes I've had to, I've had to at least like defend the five. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was always really short. I was always like the shortest kid in my class until between sophomore year and junior year of high school. I had a growth spurt of nine, a growth spurt of nine inches in one year. Anthony Davis wow. in the house. So yeah, it was right? like, yeah, for my last year playing it, I played in high school for my, and I played the first three years. I didn't play senior year, but like for junior year, I, I went through this weird thing of like, they started putting me at the wing and I was, I was like, I've been a point guard my whole life. What is this? So it was like a weird, like growing pains situation. Um, and then I didn't play in college, but I played like intramurals and stuff like that. My yeah. residential college won the, the, the tournament my freshman year, which is pretty sweet. Um, but then it just lived on of playing like in started in playing in like, you know, at gyms and stuff. And then when I was in Seattle, actually, there's this place called Puget Sound Basketball League where they just like ran like a pickup thing every single weekend. You like pay like five bucks and then they would cap it at uh, like 12 people. So they each or 12 or and they have the people. same stuff in New York, like indoor hoops and all that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. So I started doing that in Seattle. I've kept doing it here in New York before pandemic and i've just now established myself as like a dream on green of like if you leave me wide the hell open i'll make a shot but i'm also mainly just going to play a lot of hard defense and be incredibly annoying uh yeah love to have on your team hate to to play against guy it's funny yeah. you say I, the growth spurt because it's, that's how like some of these centers are so good because they mm -hmm. play point yeah. guard their entire life and then boom now they're seven feet tall well, the, the original the original was scotty pippen and now anthony yeah. davis is the, is the same way yeah um but yeah, like I, so I was always basketball first. Like I actually didn't start playing. Tennis ended up being my best sport, but I didn't start playing until like much later uh, along. Like I was in like middle school before I started playing. So growing up, I was like completely obsessed with both playing and watching basketball. Like I, if you've heard the podcast at all, Chris, like I, I grew up in the Chicago area, like during the nineties. So my entire life was that Jordan team. Um, but yeah, so like I, I grew up, I was, pr I was pretty good. Like I ended up not playing in high school. Um, and then kind of similar to, to Mike, like I um, did like intramurals and like club basketball and stuff like that in college. And now, now I've, I, I think I've, I've settled into being like always one of the better players in a pickup game, but I'm fine <laughs> with that being my ceiling. Yeah. I would, I'm a real, I'm a real Lamar Odom type. I'm a lefty. I can shoot from the outside. I can drive. Uh, very much like Barack Obama, I have no right hand. And as soon as people figure that out, I'm screwed. But like people always lean on your right hand, just assuming you're a righty. And I've scored so many points just based on that. I do like the comparison. You're like Odom and Obama, the two big O's in basketball. Put them together. The two, the two big O's, uh, one of whom visits brothels particularly uh, more than the other one. Yeah, a, a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more than the other one. Um, so when you guys are coming up with an episode, how long does it usually take you? Do you guys script a lot of it? Is a lot of free form? How do you kind of do that? I mean, very briefly before we record, we'll, we'll touch about like what, what we'll touch on what we're going to cover, mainly in the full court press section. Um, the other stuff, you know, whoever for that episode has three on three, which is where we rank like the three best and the three worst of any given category or whoever has that actually happened. The other segment where it's like a history, this wild Shaquille O'Neal story or the time Sue Bird got, you know, was on fire and did this. So that kind of stuff will give a little bit of a heads up to make sure that like they're not the exact same thing or it's not something we've already covered on the show. 
but not usually we try to keep those secret. But then right before recording for Full Core Press, it's like, hey, let's talk about this Kyrie tweet. Let's talk about uh, what Shaq said on TNT. Like, let's talk about this funny thing that Jamal Murray did, whatever it is. So I'm sure Kyrie none of it is ever none of it is ever like scripted scripted. Okay. Nah, it's yeah. it's just very quickly like here's what we should touch on um that'll go for like five ten minutes and then we record usually recording is like we'll have an hour and 15 minutes worth of audio and then our editor misha stanton chunks that down to like between 50 and 60 minutes uh and then that makes the episode oh, so yeah. not i mean i can't the episode no so how long does that episode usually go for? I said not not everything makes the episode then. So how long does it go no. for? No, yeah, I would say usually it's like an just hour like trim, and trimming minutes. trimming the fat basically, like okay. you know that's. Sort of, but I mean, I can't speak for Mike, but I think, um, you know, there's a a decent amount of prep time that goes into getting ready for an episode in terms of like the research that goes into it. Um, mm, yeah, depending on what it is that you're talking about. So like that that's at least like a few hours, and then. Um, for the Patreon that we have, we like expand some of those things. So like for three on three, we like expand it into five on five, but it's only available if you like are a patron. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so like more of the work is on the back end of if you're doing that actually happen the store, you got to do the research of like looking into what actually happened and, and getting articles and quotes and stuff like that. Um, coming up, with, coming up with that stuff. And then also just like generally I am trying, I'm already a basketball fan, but I'm trying to stay on top of, what's happening that week so before recording just double checking like what happened on twitter this week checking like the top posts of the reddit nba subreddit is pretty solid for just all of the like talkable moments that happened in the past two weeks so just yeah. doing little checks on that to make sure we're not forgetting anything reddit's a crazy place you could check the nba or you could make millions of dollars in the stocks dude what a wild <laughs> what a wild situation that is upsetting but completely unsurprising it's bizarre it's it's funny that you see it you're like whoa what's going on and you see a group on reddit started you're like i cannot i cannot wait funny. for uh the, the big short two gamestop <laughs> i mean that's oh, going to be geez. a great sequel <laughs> it's funny because like i think it's funny uh, the whole situation is hilarious especially when they stopped it because like uh oh we're about to lose our company what, what a bunch of dicks <laughs> of course it's a free market until rich people lose a, then we yeah, have to exactly. we have to change the rules and you gotta change the rules because god forbid we lose our company but it's funny god forbid that. the poors get money <laughs> they're not allowed to have it i did notice that a lot of people buying our normies are the normies supposed to be doing this normal people can't know what to do <laughs> But it's it's funny that it's GameStop. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> of, of all, all the things, of all the ones, the thing that we all hated all of our lives because we tried to sell our old games and they'd be like, "I'll give you this piece of lint and a nickel." <laughs> uh, about five dollars store credit for the brand new Madden. Yeah, and it's like you you almost couldn't pick a more doomed company. Like it, it would be <laughs> like if like all of a sudden J.C. Penney was trading at like five hundred dollars a share. It's like what well, is happening? They moved I from didn't even GameStop to AMC. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, where are they going to go to next? But yeah, the it, the first person to ever get money from GameStop. It's great. Yeah, it's pretty great much. to see. It just, it only I, I think the, ne the next one is going to be like investing in some sort of buffet, like something else that like doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I, w I was legitimately mad when like Golden the Grout. jokes, the joke ones yeah. started coming out more when it was going beyond like GameStop, who could have predicted? But when Nokia started going, I was like, oh, I should have predicted that one. And then BlackBerry, I was like, oh, I should have <laughs> predicted that one. I like. What, I feel like the new market is trying to pick what company will become a meme. So like trying to think of something like, does build a bear workshop, right? Like, is that- Yo, I'm gonna created? invest in, like, I'm gonna invest in <laughs> Bing. Can I invest in Bing? Do Ooh, I invest in Microsoft? Is that, is that Jeep still there? Is that still a thing? <laughs> well, um, let, me, let, let me ask him. Yeah, yeah. Well, ask him. Ask Ask Jeeves if Ask Jeeves is still Ask Jeeves. Can I buy stock in Neopets.com? <laughs> Chris, how, how old are you? I'm surprised you know what Ask Jeeves is. I'm 27. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, all right. I'm older. I'm much older than nice. you probably thought. I didn't know. <laughs> coming, coming as a student at Gonzaga, but I am a graduate. Yeah, student. I figured I was going to have to like gotcha. learn all the new lingo for uh, for the current, you know, Oh, I know all the lingo. <laughs> you want me to start naming them off? <laughs> I don't know. All the lingo, don't no, make me do it is that. such a no tired idea. thing for how, people how of different guys, ages. How would do. you guys describe your podcast? I don't know. I guess it's pretty lit. <laughs> pretty lit. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good podcast. You should listen, uh, subscribe, listen. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. Smash the like button. Us, smash the like button. <laughs> like and subscribe for more content. Um, so when you guys are releasing an episode, uh, 
how when when are you sorry let me rephrase that when you're releasing episodes what day do you release and where can people find you for those episodes Sure. So episodes come out every other Monday. Um, they're wherever you can listen to podcasts. So Spotify, Apple, uh, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, whatever you use. Um, we usually record like the Thursday before an episode comes out. Of course, all NBA news seems to take place between Thursday evening and Sunday <laughs> evening. Of course. Uh, to the all, point where all, it's like a running joke. Yeah. Yeah. We've been very lucky in that we have we have recorded like just after the Russell Westbrook trade happened and then the Harden trade. Like by some grace of things changing, we were able to uh, we were able to not miss the boat there. But yeah, so we release them every other Monday, uh, and yeah, wherever you wherever you find your podcast is where you can listen to them. Awesome, Mike, Adam, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be right back on Offstage Radio. Welcome back off stage radio, the basketball episode. And everybody knows how good I am at basketball. So we got Jackie Jamelis with us. Jamelis. I kept trying to get it right. That's why I asked. I had to get it right. And then I look it up to make sure I get it right. And it's wrong when I looked it up. I can't. We talked nope. about this pre-show. Great yeah. last names. They, they get mistaken. Exactly. It's, like they, it's rare when someone gets it right the first time. It, how surprised are you when someone does that? when they, they say it in there, you're like, that was correct. You know, I don't even know if that's ever happened. So. <laughs> wow. I wish I could have been, that would have been fantastic. If I just came in, it's like, uh, Jamelis, right? And you're like, yeah. Yeah. I would have been shocked. It, like it seriously never happened. But I am the same way. Nobody ever gets my last name right. I think I've had it right a couple times because I share the same last name with somebody from Ice Road Truckers. <laughs> so sometimes those Ice Road Trucker fans will know my last name, which there's a lot more than you might think. There's a lot more than you might think. But how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. How yeah, no doing? problem. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are so happy to have you along. And, and 2020 was a just up and down great year for you huh just i was reading the athletic article on you last night and just reading it i was so i was reading i was like look i'll get some information i was re i was so just engaged in that that whole article it was great it was a fantastic article i was great read and it was good to read about like how the year went for you and stuff like that um well thank you i appreciate that yeah of course uh so i'm gonna just start with right with with the the injuries you've had because you've had that's when you when you look up your career that's what comes up is the injuries you had you had the ACL injuries um but how many actual injuries because that there was the five ACLs in is the big one but like when I was going through some of the interviews you've done and stuff like that it, you've had meniscus injuries and all this how many injuries have you actually had in your career do you know like a number or a ballpark yeah, um well I actually I just had my um not just had, but I had my 10th knee surgery. Um, so I, my big ones were my five ACL repairs that happened in college. Well, the last game of my senior year in high school and then four more times during my college career. Um, but I have had 10 knee surgeries. Um, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of scopes and clean outs and things like that. Cause a lot of cartilage damage throughout the years. Um, I've had a meniscus in there somewhere. I did like a stem cell injection, which they actually require you to, um, you know, to be asleep and everything for that. So, um, I mean, I don't even know how many injuries, I guess, like, I guess I would just say five, because I think that meniscus was in there with one of the ACLs. Mm -hmm. um, but the other ones were just like maintenance and cleanups and things like that. And did the ACLs, I they were early on, right? You said there one, was one in high school, there was one in college, or were there a couple in college? Like, they are very early yeah. on in your career? Yeah, so it was very consecutive. Um, the last game of my senior year in high school, so I was, um, you know, 16, 17 years old, whatever I was. And then every year consecutively after that, it happened. So I think my last one, um, the last major surgery I had was in um, – 2013 the beginning of 2013 so um i've been like i've been pretty healthy for the last eight or so years knocking on wood were, were there any like theories you had of why you had so many knee injuries so 
consecutively so early? Like, was there something going on or was it just like the way you moved or anything like that? Uh, you know, I've gone over this in my head millions of times. Um, I, I, at a really young age, I, I developed a really good work ethic. Um, yeah, I was, I was playing probably three to five hours a day from a young age. I, w- I mean, I was obsessed with basketball and um, started in like fifth grade. I was, you know, playing every day with the guys, grew up playing with the guys, um, you know, on the pavement every day at recess. And um, I have a gym down the street where I grew up playing against, you know, all the older guys in college and high school guys that I was playing after, um, you know, after school or whatever it was, just putting in hours and hours uh, into the game. That's what I love doing. Um, and I also had a big influence. My dad, um, he was a good player back in the day. So he kind of paved the way for me in terms of, um, you know, my love for the game, my passion for it, my work ethic. He set those standards for me. And um, I think that we just, we started really, really young. And um, I, you know, I, we don't know if, if that had anything to do with the early on injuries. Um, you know, we've had doctors that just told me that my knees weren't meant for basketball. So that's a possible, um, you know, situation that it could have been, or maybe I was just unlucky. I don't know. You know, it's just, uh, it's just what it is, you know, with, with how your career has gone. And, and again, your name was brought up with the, the article and the athletic, would you actually consider yourself unlucky with them? Or do you think like, like, because your, your name is known and you've been shouted out by some of the biggest names in the WNBA from all this, like, do you think it's an unlucky thing? Or do you think like this is the path you were supposed to go? Oh, now I definitely think this was the path for me. Um, I think at one point I felt like I was unlucky because I had this idea in my head that if I wasn't injured, then I would have been one of the top players. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so of course I had that, like that thought at at some time, but I think as my life went on and I realized how much bigger this has been than basketball for me um, and how many lives I've touched and how many people I've kind of helped uh, along with this injury. um, It's been, it's been, amazing for me and I've accepted it and I've, and I love it. And I don't think I would have it any other way. Um, I mean, obviously the, the pain I go through it in my knees on a daily, I wish that wasn't there, but um, I wouldn't do it any other way. And uh, basketball has been everything for me. So that's just been what it is. Yeah. Your resilience is unmatched um, when it comes to coming back off injuries and everything. Was there somebody that inspired you through it? Like that you looked at like, wow, they were so resilient. I can do it too. And now people look at you like that. Yeah. You know, I don't, I never really had that. um, I guess that like resilient icon or anything. I think for me, um, what got me through it was the support system that I had, my family, my friends, I always had a, just a tremendous tribe, you know, of people and people that supported me and supported my dreams. Um, I'm also extremely stubborn and very competitive. Um, so when a doctor or physical therapist or someone tells me I can't do something, it's automatically like something goes off in my head where I'm like, okay, I'll show you I can, you know? Um, so I, I think it's just been the the support system around me and my childhood and my upbringing and everything uh, that really pushed me through it and got me through it. And you had so much success in high school and then you had success in uh, college, got drafted, and then you had to end up going overseas. At the time, did you feel like, how did how was that mentally for you? Because you got to your goal of getting drafted and then you have to go overseas to try to get back into the league. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the time it wasn't my ideal situation. Um, but if I wouldn't have gone overseas, it would have been the biggest mistake of my life. Um, I mean, it's been so good to me. It's been so wonderful being able to play overseas and, um, you know, playing in all these different countries and all these different amazing leagues, Euro cup, Euro league, um, you know, basketball over there is just as good as it is over here. It's just in Europe. Um, and it's a different game, completely different game. 
Um, but I think that going over there is, is the reason why I was able to get back in the WNBA. Um, and they also value basketball in a different way there as well. Um, the, the fan base that we get over there is like no other. You know, they're just obsessed. Um, not even necessarily obsessed with women's basketball, but just obsessed with their club. Mm -hmm. You know, they were born and raised in that particular place, and that's their club, and they're diehard no matter what. Um, so I think that all those things that like, kind of played a part in my in into my success, um, and I love it over there. It's it's definitely it was definitely I found my niche in Europe. Now, what's that process like? So you get drafted, and then you get cut, and you're like, how do you come up to the decision of all right, now I'm going to go play in Europe? How do you find the team? How do you figure out that's what you want to do? Yeah, well, um, I was blessed to have a great agent. Um, I shout out to Allison Gaylor. Um, I, I've been with her. I was her first client. Actually, Lisa Leslie was her first client, but this was after she, her playing career. Um, so Al, I actually started off with Allison. She was younger than me at the time when I chose to go with her. Um, but she had such a, an amazing reputation. Um, and, you know, I knew that there were, her future was going to be super bright. And, and we were, we connected on a friendship level. So, um, I, her, her expertise and just, um, knowledge for what to do as an agent, she was able to place me in Athens, Greece, and that's my heritage. My dad is from Greece. So I was able to obtain a, um, a Greek passport there. So I was a dual citizen, um, played in Greece as a Greek player. So I didn't count as a foreigner. And then um, fast forward, I'm, I played in Europe as a European, not as an American. And that's extremely valuable because I am American. Um, so because of that, um, you know, I was able to kind of really jumpstart an amazing career overseas in Europe. And going back to playing in Greece, you played for the Greek national team. Mm -hmm. Now, was that a surprise to you or were you expecting, like, I think I'm playing so well, they're going to give me a call because now I'm a Greek citizen through all this? Um, yeah, I, so it, it's been a long journey with the Greek national team, um, it's, I mean, such an incredible opportunity to be a part of any national team. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a different kind of pride because I grew up at identifying as a Greek. Um, you know, my, my, my family here is all Greek. Um, and I don't know if you know any Greeks, but they're very prideful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, so being able to go over there and play for the national team and represent my country um, was really incredible. And all the girls there, uh, you know, welcomed me with such open arms. Um, even though I wasn't in, you know, from Greece, I was from America. So it was, it was really cool. Uh, I know, I don't know personally Greeks, but I've lived in New York. So I've definitely met a Greek or two <laughs> in New York. And I, I could see that in, in those people. Um, yeah. So you made it back to the U S in 2015. Uh, but most notably, again, because I read the article most notably for me that it was last year because you had the story of you were on the sun, then you got waved and you got picked up by the mystic um, that same day, I believe it said, right? 10 PM that same day. And right. then you go on to make this playoff run and then you play your idol in the playoffs. Like it, how exciting was it for you last year? Just all this going on. Yeah. I mean, I think that that summer, the 2020 bubble, it's going to be, a memory I'm going to carry with me forever. Um, definitely such a monumental time in my career. So many emotions, um, you know, getting on the roster in the first place, being in the bubble, a complete high. Um, and then going through the ups and downs of not playing, you know, you work so hard, you train so hard, you feel like you deserve to play and then you don't get to play. Um, and then kind of, living with that and being okay with that and then all of a sudden getting cut um and you know you've kind of established this life already in the bubble I was there for like a month and a half doing the same thing every day I was completely a part of my team I loved my team and it was just like a business move you know boom like I was off the team um and then my agent called me and she said just hang tight don't pack your bags yet let's let's see if any of the other teams in the bubble will pick you up and then within yeah, like 10 or 12 hours, Coach Tebow called me from the Mystics 
Um, and he was just like, hey, scoot your Connecticut gear over. We're going to bring you some Washington gear. Like, we play tomorrow. We play Atlanta tomorrow. You're going to play. And I'm just like, you know, whoa, this is, like, so intense. But also just, I mean, I if those are problems or troubles for me, I would deal with those anytime. <laughs> Now, do you think that because you were already in the bubble, it increased your chances? Because if they're signing somebody, they're going to look for somebody. They're not going to look for somebody that's not there. They're not going to try to bring somebody in, especially because you played the next day. Of course. Um, so I do mean, you think yeah. how, yeah. how much do you think that increased your chances? Um, I mean, I definitely think it it helped. Um, I mean, at the same time, you know, I don't know how many players that weren't in the bubble that uh, pe that those teams wanted you know who knows I don't know what players were available um but me being there and being not having to go through um you know a quarantine or not having to go through any COVID protocols or anything it definitely helped now let's talk a little bit about the bubble because I'm just so interested to know what it was like I mean you see it from the out obviously I see it from the outside looking in but what was it like being in the bubble what was it like mentally uh, what were some of the protocols? Did you get tested all the time? Did you have to stay away from each other? Like, what are some things like that? Um, yeah, so we were tested every single day for 78 days straight. Um, the nose test, too? The one where they go up to the bridge? Yeah, oral and, and nose. It was, oh. yeah, it was awful. I can't stand that. test. Like, I get it and I take it, but man, yeah. do I hate it. Oh, the tear yeah. ducts start immediately and it's just bad. Yeah, you know, and it was just like an everyday thing. That part was, that was the probably the worst part of the bubble. Um, but it was it was set up so great. Um, I think the WNBA did such a great job making all of that happen. Um, as far as the protocols go, and you know, feeling safe within that bubble, I think everyone felt really safe. Um, even you know the workers coming in and out, we had some questions about that but the way that they were treated and tested and um you know the WNBA just did such a great job um you got tired of it you know it was so repetitive because there wasn't anything to do I think like the highlight of all of our days was like riding our bikes to to practice you know because it was like oh we're outside we're just riding bikes like we're free but then it was also like a million degrees outside so that wasn't fun <laughs> Um, but like, you know, being able to be around greatness every single day from when you wake up to when you go to bed, um, for me, it was a treat. And I felt like I'm kind of the uh, type of person that's really made for a bubble because I love basketball and mm -hmm. all you do is eat, sleep, play basketball, recover. Um, and then you kind of just hang out with the girls that are around, play games, play card games and just talk and, um, I loved it. So it was amazing to me. So when you say hang out, were you only able to interact with your team or were you able to interact with other players? I'm, Cause I'm sure you're friends with pl players on different teams and stuff like that. Were you able to see them as well? Or did you have to keep it kind of team oriented for the whole time? No, no, of course we were able to be with other teams. I mean, what are they going to do for 78 days? So you can't yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I was wondering. That'd be, that'd be yeah. awful. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely not. We, um, I mean, you have to realize, too, we were in the same hotel as our coaching staff, same hotel as the referees. <laughs> so it was just like everyone was on top of each other. So at one point, it was just like it was laughable because you can't go in and out of the hotel without crossing everyone. So, like, if you were upstairs drinking with your teammates, every coach downstairs knew, but it's also like, <laughs> you know, we're adults, we're going to do as we please, but it's, it just sucks. We had to do it every day in front of them, you know? Yeah. Did that kind um, of feel like when, uh, like a, when you were in high school and you went on like a road trip and you knew the coaches were down the hall, but like, you still yeah. did it anyway? Oh, for sure. It was very much like that. But then at some point it's just like, everyone was so familiar with everyone's habits and tendencies. Everyone was just like, Oh, whatever. Like, cheers, you know, it's like, it is what it is being so close you probably learn some things about people you're like wow like i could have went my whole life without knowing this about you and then other people maybe you're like wow this i'm great we had this time but yeah spending all 78 days with the same 
I'm, cause I'm assuming like you're with the same core, even with other teams, like, yeah, you're going to see other people, but you're basically with the same core yeah, for most of it. Core. Yeah. Everyone develops their clicks and having that same core probably after 78 days. I mean, listen, I lived at home for a while and I, you know, I love my family, but after 78 days straight, I think I'd be like, all right, I need to go somewhere else. No, for sure. It was, you know, like I said, in the end, it got kind of like, okay, here we go again, you know, you get kind of tired of it. But then within a few days after leaving the bubble, I was having anxiety. So I'm like, I want to go back. I want to be back in there. You know, I've been, I've been like itching to get out of there, but it's like, now I want to go back. <laughs> with with COVID going on, do you think it'd be smart to do a bubble again? Or do you think that they should do how like all the other leagues are doing? Because all the other leagues are not like they're doing okay, but they're not really like the NFL really struggled. The NBA is having then the NHL is really bad right now. I think five teams have outbreaks. MLB had outbreaks. Like all like, do you think they should just do a bubble again? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the bubble had a lot of benefits and it's, I think the biggest benefit was that we didn't have to travel and that is such a save on your body, you know? Um, and also it's just a safer situation. Um, I think that there's nothing wrong with the bubble. I personally think they should do it again. I don't think they should do it in the same, in the same IMG in Florida. I think they should do it somewhere else, but I like it because we don't have to travel to play. You know, we don't have to go uh, across the United States to go play New York. If you're on a West coast team, you know, it's just, it's just more convenient. So I think we should. Now, if I remember right, the WNBA started the bubble before before the nba even had a thought did it upset you that you guys did it first and it really did not get even close to the recognition of the nba i mean you know at this point is it upsetting i mean yeah of course it's upsetting but like we're used to it you know we're used to the treatment not being the same um on many different uh angles um but I think that we did some things this summer that got more notability and recognition than any other league, like the social social injustice movements yeah. uh, that we had a big, a big role in, um, you know, so we did some pretty cool things too. So it's just like, it's baby steps and it's a process. And I think we're moving in the right direction. I think so too. And it's, I watched from end to end, it's, uh, South Carolina versus UConn the other day and what a game it was. And I then so I don't know the details of it. I know Paige went off and yes. she's incredible. That's about yes. all I know. Yes. She hit a, she hit two extremely clutch shots. The three she hit at the end was incredible hits goes up, comes back down, goes in. Yeah. She was so good. Um, but then yeah. it's upsetting at the same time because it was on like Fox sports one or something like that. And it's, like on the secondary channel, it's the number yeah, one team bad. versus number two team. Like if if Baylor and Gonzaga were playing each other, it'd be on Fox, it'd be on ESPN. And it's like, right. it's it's right. the steps like that, like that obviously is out of the control of the WNBA or the players, but steps like that, like these, it will help grow the sport. And it's just up to these broadcast companies and things like that to really help it as well. Like. Uh, it frustrates me because I like to see everybody. Yeah. Say, like I said, it was a great, it was an amazing game. It went in overtime. It was an amazing game and some clutch yeah. shots and, and big yeah. plays made, but I'm going to yeah. go off if I don't stop there. I mean, I, so. you're gonna, you're yeah, I, I, w I really would. It was so good. And that three at the end was so incredible. It hits the back. It goes up. You think it's coming out. It goes in, ends the game, but I if, did that part. Like I said, if I don't stop here, I might go off. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to simmer down and continue going. Um, can you talk a little bit about mental health in the female athletes? You've been very transparent, obviously through your journey with multiple injuries and maybe can you talk a little bit about your experience in mental health um, through it all? Yeah. Um, are we on the same, uh, is it okay? The, the connection right now? I can hear you. Can everybody do a okay. thumbs up when emoji if you could hear? Just wanted to make sure I felt like it was maybe a little delayed. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I think for me, um, it was rough in the beginning, like the mental health aspect of it, um, especially in my first couple of injuries. Um, I gained a lot of weight. I didn't really understand the severity of eating good and eating clean. 
Um, and I think that gaining weight and not playing basketball kind of put my mental health in um, like a fragile state. Um, I think that a lot of athletes will go through some sort of depression or some sort of challenge when they're injured, um, feeling like alienated from your teammates, not feeling a part of anything, um, obviously not being able to play the game you love. I think that uh, that was really hard for me. And, and it took me two or three ACL tears to actually understand um, the severity of a lot of small things and that I never repeated in my fourth and fifth time. So it's like, I feel like I would love to be a voice to people that are going through that injury and like let them know ahead of time what to expect and what you should and should do. Um, because if I had someone like that that was behind me in it, I think it would have helped me a lot. Um, but you know, I another thing that I think was so important to my um, success coming out of the injuries was the support system that I had around me. And I know I talked about that earlier, mm -hmm. but um, for my mental health, that was extremely important because I always had great people around me. Um, people that, you know, wanted the same things for me, wanted all the good things for me. Um, and, and I did, and I saw, um, you know, some sports psychologists during my college career too, that I think played a vital role in, in helping me get out of all of this too. Um, it's, it's a real thing, you know, depression because of um, injuries and because of your sport. Like we go through a lot of different emotions. Mentally, it's so taxing. Even if you're not injured, it's just a hard process. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that I, I struggled at, during times, but then uh, it made me stronger in the end. Everything, all the adversity and everything that happened, it ended up making me a lot stronger of a person and player. I've actually, uh, when we had a class, we had um, Dr. Lynn Hickey on, and I, that was a question I wanted to ask her. We didn't get to it was that I do you think all college programs should have a sports psychologist for stuff like this, like injuries or just do you see so many uh, mental breakdowns and stuff like that just because of the schedule or whatever. And to have because did you have that like in college and or did you go seek a uh, no, we had, we had an athletic um, sports psychologist. There was like two and they oversaw all sports. Um, but like, yeah, it's undervalued. I don't know what the situation is now in college, but I think every team should have one and that person should travel with the team. You know, I, I, it's a huge, huge thing. I agree. And especially because some people can handle it. Like I said, the schedule and like, especially when you get to college, it's different. You might not be, you know, you might have been the, the best player in your county and then you get to college and you're the 10th player on the bench. Like just because you were great in high school does not mean you were going to be good after that. So like having that person there to really help you through it, I think it should be required for all college sports and all sports. I think just all sports, especially when you hear stories from the bubble last year, like they should have had one on uh, in, in the bubble with them to go through. I don't know if they did. Obviously, well, I was not had, in the bubble, but yeah, we had access to mm -hmm someone via zoom mm -hmm. and the league provided it and i think it was like one one girl for all the teams and it was like we had like team zoom meetings i don't know how often they they were but it's like it's not enough you know no like especially because something like that like you don't want to do it as a group not you don't want a group therapy session you yeah. want to do that individually so you could really open up and, and not have to worry about people around you or stuff like that so that's yeah, totally. I, it's nice they provided it, but it definitely could have been tweaked a little better to not yeah, do yeah, group no, sessions. We need more. It's super undervalued. Um, and that should definitely be something that they, they work on. So let's switch it up really quick. You have a brand called Overcome that you started a couple of years ago. What sparked um, you creating that and what does it mean to you? So what sparked the Overcome brand was obviously my story. Um, overcoming my injuries and my adversity through um, with basketball. And I wanted to do something um, where I could kind of obviously brand, you know, myself and, and, and everything that I went through, but also being able to share inspirational messages through my clothing line. Um, growing up in, or going to college in LA and um, you know, you're so much involved and like, you see so much fashion and so many 
people that I was around had their own clothing lines and they were doing their own thing. They had their own brand. And I thought it was just so cool. I always loved that. Um, and I have a lot of tattoos and I'm a very like emotional person. Um, so I think starting a clothing line for me was perfect and it made sense I, from all, for all the traveling and stuff that I do, like being able to have an online store um, and be able to kind of tell my story through my merchandise was really, it's been a lot of fun for me and it's been just like a super cool hobby. Um, definitely didn't start it to like make money or anything like that. It was just like solely for, um, you know, a hobby and it made me happy and I've, I've been having a lot of fun doing it. And finally, one last question. What is the best advice you can give somebody that might be in a similar situation as you? Maybe had injuries, something they had to overcome, something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, pretty cliche, but I think just following your passion, following your heart, never giving up. Um, we only have one life to live, you know, and no one wants to live, go through a life and regret that they didn't do something. So I always believed in myself. Um, I, I live by this quote, it's the magic of risking everything for a dream that nobody sees but you. Um, and I think a majority of my career, I always had people that doubted me and, and doctors and physical therapists that were telling me that I shouldn't do something. Uh, but it was a dream that I had and something that I wanted to do. Um, so it was, my biggest advice is just to follow your heart, do what you love. If you have that passion for it, never give up until it's, you know, you've accomplished your dream. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us and we'll be right back. Thank you for having me. Mike and Adam were great great guests but jackie's story is so good it's so good if you haven't read it i i mentioned the athletic article definitely go check that out there's a whole article about her in the bubble and and uh the night she got cut and it's kind of all condensed into a story it's so good and there's great interviews and stuff with her as well including this one but there's other great interviews definitely check out her story and and follow her on whatever social medias um you can because her story is really good and she's doing she's gonna be doing great things so definitely go check her out if you haven't already and as for the horse podcast, it's called Horse Hoops. Go check that out. I know I keep calling it the Horse Podcast. It's called Horse Hoops. Go check that out if you want to know more about basketball. They don't just talk about the, the stats and this and that. They talk about the in-depth and, and personal life and all this other stuff of the players. So definitely go check them out if you're into basketball or if you're just in the podcast or if you're just into Adam or Mike. Whatever one comes first or second or third, just go check them out. Go check them all out. And check us out at uh, at off.stage.radio on Instagram, at offstage radio on uh, Twitter, offstage radio on Facebook. I think it's facebook.com slash offstage radio, schnabelproductions.com slash offstage radio, YouTube slash XZZR. I'm just kidding. But if you look up offstage radio, you'll be able to find us. If you can't find us, just go to offstage uh, radio on Schnabel Productions. We're definitely on there. So check that out. Oh, I just said too much and I did not say it in the correct order. So whatever. Uh, definitely join us next week. Um, get the new episodes. Make sure if you go on and subscribe, you hit the little notification. Now I sound like a YouTube ad, but I'm going to sound like a YouTube ad for a second. If you hit the notification, you get notifications of when we go. Uh, our new episode comes out. They come out seven o'clock Pacific time on, uh, on YouTube and on all the other streaming devices. So you can definitely get that. And we are also on iHeartRadio, um, something we have not promoted a lot, but we're on iHeartRadio. So if you have iHeartRadio, that's the number one podcasting site. Go there and check us out as well. All right, thank you for joining us. Replay this if you want some good inspiration. Go ahead and check out old episodes. We have a bunch of old episodes. They're all archived on the website. Go check it out. I've been Christian Awa. This has been Offstage Radio. Later. Deuces. Bye. Boom. Little Antoine Winfield for you. Ooh.